American International School of Chennai. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we, um, how we are doing competency-based learning uh, at the International School of Chennai, um, and indirectly how we use technology to support it. Um, what I will say at the beginning is, you'll come away from this a lot of, with a lot of questions. This is a, a 15 or 14 minute summary of four or five years of hard work, communication, um, energy, effort, learning. And you will have questions, you will be frustrated, you may be confused, but that's great because that's what it feels like before you learn. That's, that's the objective of learning, to overcome that. Um, and so you will not hear all the answers today. What, what we are focusing on is, is doing something. Um, I hear a lot of talk. Um, and what we're trying to do in the, the leadership team um, that I work with, we are trying to do. Um, and we are failing, and we are succeeding, and we are growing as a result. But first, before we get into competency-based education, have a look at those words on the board there. Um, whether it's experiential, proficiency, social emotional we've managed to wrap ourselves around a vocabulary of 21st century skills and are getting befuddled and lost within it. Um, so I'd like for a moment for you to suspend your particular vocabulary. Just compress all of this into a ball. Um, I'm not going to distinguish between them for you. Okay? Um, so whether you're talking about learning behaviors, educational habits, proficiency-based learning, okay. But for the moment, let's just categorize that under a banner of competency-based education. And I'll give you an insight into what we believe that is in a second. Um, it's general traits, general qualities of competency-based education uh, are here. And I'll kind of review these quickly, but just to give you an insight right now, I'll talk about them later. But the idea is that there, are, there is a movement, and it's fairly fundamental. Some of these things, you might even think, well, how does that even work? Um, and I'll try and give you as much insight as I can in, in this time. Um, some of the highlights is it's focus, currently, we're focused on time served. You come into my classroom, you sit for a semester, and I give you credit. Um, what we're moving towards is one focused on mastery. If you appear at my school speaking four languages, you deserve credit. You deserve to be recognized for the talent and competency that you have. If you come to my school as a maths virtuoso, you should be recognized as such. Um, we shouldn't be holding kids accountable for time spent in seats. Um, another really interesting one is fixed subjects with specific criteria. Um, so all of our schools used to have the idea of a science curriculum with science standards, with science content. Um, what I'm proposing and what we're doing and what we're moving towards for the kids that want to get involved in it is transdisciplinary criteria. What if we started looking and measuring things between subjects? What if the creativity you used in art could be applied to the creativity you use in English? And so, um, Finally, I think this whole issue of maxing out, that the area that I work in, we have students that just max it out. The time they spend, they're all getting A's, they're all outstanding, they go to universities, and, and they have an incredible challenge in differentiating between them. What, what, how, how does that even work? Whereas in a competency-based model, it forces options. You can't both be an amazing speaker, a, an incredibly critical thinker, um, and able to move or build communities online. Um, there are very, very discreet competencies that, um, that we offer. Why? I'm a great believer in Simon Sinek's why. Um, don't believe the thing that I'm selling you. Believe the, the kind of reason I'm selling it to you. Um, and what I'm selling is not a product. Thank you for being in here and not next door with Amazon, um, who will be. Um, what I'm kind of talking about is a pedagogical ideology, a model of thinking. I'm not saying buy tech. What I'm saying is rethink how you measure education and learning. So you can put your own why in there. I've heard about, you know, you know uh, the water I swim in is about uh, occupational mobility. If you're worried about jobs, that's the why. If you're worried about um, employability, put that in there. You can fill the blank, blank space. If you've been listening over the last few days, you'll have your own whys. Um, I can give you mine. And it's a, it's a limited perspective, but it's one that's mission-centric to me. It's one that I wholeheartedly believe in. And that's in the children's narrative. Because we can change the walls and the ceilings and the floors, and we can, we can change how we speak to kids and the medium by which we deliver to them. But what really matters and what the, the actual key is, is their reality. Have they noticed a change? Do they feel any different? Do they, they, they think any differently about learning? Because if not, then it's moving decks around a sinking ship. It is not really changing anything if they don't perceive it. And so currently, um, maybe four or five years ago, when I was working uh, around Southeast Asia, these are the narratives I was hearing. GPA. Can you sum me up in one number? I dare you. Um, 
and I, I find it abhorrent that we still do that to kids, particularly in the American system. A single number determines you as an educational being. Um, an A or a C. Okay, I'm a B. You're a B. What's the difference between us? How do I get to an A? Oh, sorry, we're not going to articulate that for you. It's going to we remain abstract in this weird letters and numbers system whereby we judge you but don't give you an insight into how to change. JE is a similar sort of thing, standardized testing. Um, kids are asking, what counts? So the time I spend sitting listening to you counts, but the time I spend running an NGO in, uh, on the side, the time I spend influencing um, and active, you know, kind of doing activism online doesn't count. The amazing sporting achievements that I do in my own time don't count. The public speaking I might do or the things that I might lead don't count. That's an interesting narrative to purvey. Um, and again, more and more, now what do I do? What, what are these things worth? What are the things, um, how much is the education I'm spending my time and or money on? How much is it worth? Final exam stress. I, I see a lot of, lot of talk about how stressed kids are and really a, a very little action in terms of addressing it because we're still measuring them by the same yardstick and not really asking them what counts. And then finally, they come out at the end of it asking if they're employable and media tells them they're not. It's a tragedy. And so I'd like to change these narratives. And what I'm proposing or what we're doing and what we're hearing are some of these things. What are my strengths? If you start forgetting and moving, not forgetting, but moving away from individual specific subject-based education, you start to see, well, what am I strong at? Am I a strong communicator? Am I a strong critical thinker? Am I a strong collaborator? And they're more fundamental questions about what it is to be a good learner. And then, if I know my strengths, how do I grow in these areas of weakness? Do I get an insight? Do I move away from abstraction towards an insight in how I might grow? How do I transfer my learning? Like I said, how do I take my innate creativity in the arts and music or my leadership on the sports field? How do I take those out of their little siloed boxes that we instruct them in and move them into other areas? How can that influence my language? How can it influence my science knowledge? Um, and then the final couple, like, can everything count? What if everything counted? What if all the learning that our kids are doing in and around the boxes we put them in, what if it counted? And that's what we're attempting to do. Um, so I'll go for what we are doing. Now, I say this not as, a, as an example. It will be annoying and frustrating. I've got five minutes to try and describe four and a half years of work. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover it all. But I will, will kind of try and give you a little bit of an insight into the sorts of systems and thinking models that we've started to use to develop this. Um, these are our competencies. So we don't, we are, for kids that are involved in this program, in these, in these pilots, um, you'll notice there is no science, English, maths, art, drama, education, um, structure. This is how our transcript looks. This is how our report card will look. Um, I could expand on all of these. All of these are very complex underneath, and they have a great deal of uh, framework underneath. Um, and, the, and the first thing we need to do with this is really start thinking about what the roles of some of these things. Some of these things don't seem traditionally educational. What is self-direction? And I'll tell you, it's why do we still punish kids academically for being late? Um, who, who here has handed homework in late and been punished for it, got half percent, got zero or something like that? I said, no, 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 teacher. Uh, you know, does, that, does the handing of homework in late qualify? Does it make any difference in terms of the educational value of that work? What it does is give us an opportunity to say, Really start thinking about how you conduct yourself. Start being engaged. Start focusing. And if we start using competencies to measure that self-direction, then all of a sudden you have a valid academic frame within which to help kids learn to be more responsible, to help them not be late and so on. So that's one piece of it. The next is mapping. All of you will be sitting in here. You have various disciplines. I'm, you know, I'm a biologist. How do I map the things that I need to instruct in the classroom onto this competency framework? And it's complex, and it takes years, and it takes an effort of mind and time. But what effectively it really is, is, is taking all of the things, the, the, the pieces of knowledge, and the concepts, more to the point, we have a, we are a concept-based school and a standards-based education system, um, and grouping them into these competencies. So if you're doing mathematical, if you're doing algorithms in mathematics, are there aspects of that instruction that are creative that could apply to my competencies? If you are doing a certain type of artwork, or if you're doing a, a certain type of sport, um, and there is, there is knowledge and concepts underneath, how do they apply to the competencies of collaboration? Where are we seeing these things in our classrooms? And we, we map that out. 
We work with all of our teachers to map out those individual competencies um, and fit them together. Here's a report card. Many of you will have received these a number of times throughout your life. Ours used to look like this. If you can't see at the back, reading, writing, mathematics, science, social studies, art, music, physical education. That's kind of a, a quick snapshot of ours. What if we change the dialogue? I'm not talking technology. Now, it requires some technology to underpin it, but I'm not selling tech. What I'm selling is the idea of changing the dialogue. What if, instead of focusing on all the disciplines in, that, in those rows, we actually start thinking of them as the, the, the substance, the stuff underneath, and we started really focusing on what it is to be a collaborator. So you might have your sciences over here and your art over here, um, but as you build up this model, you're able to say, well, what are you doing in collaboration? What are you doing in art? Maybe you work alone so much that you aren't really growing those skills in arts, where in science you seem to be very able to work on a multi-collaborative project. What if you could transfer that thinking? What if you could transfer those skills? What if you could grow your character? And you can widen this into all of our uh, competencies. You start to think, well, there are certain traits. You know, let's say this is uh, biology. You seem to be very talented across creativity, collaboration, and this is uh, communication and media literacy. But there are other subjects where you're deficient. Now, how can you take those challenges? How can you grow? I'm not going to hide it behind A's and B's or numbers. I'm going to ask you to make the connections and have the dialogue. And we're already doing this. We're seeing kids come up to us and say, well, what am I doing in one subject that I can apply to another? But it fundamentally requires us to stop thinking within silos, to stop thinking in buckets, and really perpetuating this myth that, because real life doesn't work like that. Back again, I'm going to keep putting these in front of you because I want you to critique them. I want you to really think, does everything in education fit under these six buckets? How can it possibly? These competencies are our floor. They're the, the, the baseline at which we uh, expect kids to achieve. Now, interesting thing about competencies, we don't grade them. There are no percentages. You just get them or you don't. There is no letter grade. There is no percentage. There is no... Um, Left, you know, none, no sort of grading system involved. It is either you achieve the competency and can graduate, or if you don't yet achieve the competency, then you spend more time doing it. Um, and these competencies are the floor. They are, we expect all of our students to be all of these things at a foundational level. Um, however, we also offer a high ceiling. Each of our competencies can be expanded and drawn out into an advanced credit. That means you can push them as far as you like. So if your real thing is communication, then I would want you to be communicating and pushing out through social media platforms and creating change. We have kids that publish poets. We have children that write impactful blogs. We have kids with hundreds of followers on YouTube about learning, com you know, learning content. Um, and each of those things should be, be able to be captured. Um, we have some incredible talent in the children that are related to the people in this room. Um, and I think giving them high ceilings to be able to demonstrate that is crucial. Um, so talking through this, I'm, again, I haven't got the time to go through it again. Um, but what I will say is kind of critique the, the traditional. I don't think it's even worth calling it traditional. Think about these things that you currently recognize in your education system. And even if you can think about moving one, moving in a single direction across one of these things, then you'll be making a difference in the way we think. We're not alone. Um, we, are, we are very, very well helped by organizations like Global Online Academy. I'm currently doing an edX course with MIT about competency-based education. Mastery Transcript Consortium is a group of 250 independent and international schools um, that are doing this work, that are doing, not talking, not protolizing, not being profits. They are doing this work in schools and piloting it. Higher education institutions, too. The big question is, will colleges take my kids? They absolutely will. And it won't always be successful. This is, this is you know, a big thing for us and our kids. What you think success looks like when we're standing on here thinking it's all that perfect stream, it's not. Um, our success it is full of challenges, it is full of mistakes, it's full of questions, particularly from parents. But they're there to be overcome, and if you don't challenge them, we will never succeed and we will never get to those reasons why. Thank you very much.